I know all of you want me to reflect on hating your mother and father, your brother and sister, and everybody else, um, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> That's a very tough passage, passage because um, it just comes at you so hard. Um, but it reminds us, and I think it was Jesus' way of getting the attention of everyone who was with him to say, this is hard stuff, being a disciple. It means um, great sacrifice. It means picking up your cross and carrying it. It means doing things you never imagined you could do, but to do it um, in the name of love. So it's, it's a very hard passage, but as I said, you won't hear more about it today. I do want to share with you, um, because it's going to shape the end of the service, and it has shaped my day for sure, for sure. Uh, but this morning, uh, my cat of 20 years, Baxter, passed away. Um, for 20 years, he was with me every time I would sit to write. Um, didn't matter if it was a sermon on Sunday morning or Saturday night or whenever it was, if I was writing something, a book, um, he would be beside me, and he was with me in my prayer time. And this morning, um, as he was dying, he was there beside me. And he could no longer sit still um, because he was beginning to fall. And so he w I lifted him down onto the floor, but he crawled to the place beside the couch, which would have been his high perch just below it, and laid there um, as I finished. So I'm going to go home after the service today, after communion and everything, so I'm not going to have a greeting line today. But I ask you to hold my wife, particularly, who's with him now, and um, my grandson, who's there as well, in your prayers. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our salvation. Amen. Some of God's creatures are comfortable in their own skin. No matter what they have faced, no matter where they have come from, they find a way to shine God's light in this world. Porter was one of those creatures. In the book Porter, A Wolf Dog and His People, Anne Esten, daughter of our beloved uh, Janet Younger of blessed memory, tells the story of an amazing wolf dog. In the words of Porter's rescuer and owner, Susan Vogt, Porter's story has so many elements and layers. It is one of overcoming anxiety and fear. He was 120 pounds of abused and unsocialized wolf dog, afraid of us, untrusting of us, and protective of himself when he came to our family. It is one of transforming fear into understanding and anxiety into love, which is really a great lesson for life in general, she continues. It is one of jumping right in to do what's right, regardless of how it will end up, and it is one of both Porter and me overcoming obstacles, never giving up on each other. But the greatest story of all, and Porter's real purpose, lies in people, all the people we met and who have become important to us because of Porter. Following Susan's forward, Anne picks up. She tells the story of Porter. She opens her book with this quote from Charles Dickens. One always begins to forgive a place as soon as it's left behind. It's a beautiful, powerful quote. When Porter is discovered at six years old, he is chained with a heavy 30-foot chain in someone's backyard here in rural Ohio. He is a terrifying sight. Frightened, neglected, abused, and so weak that the doctor who is brought in to assess him is torn between trying to rescue the dog and just putting him down right there at the site. But he takes a chance. He looks into Porter's eyes, and he sees something there. 
He takes a chance on Porter. He takes a chance that someone will step forward, and certainly that someone comes forward in the person of Susan and her husband, Colin Vogt. They nurture and they care for Porter. Not a simple task for a severely neglected wolf dog, with wolf being the first word with dog. The book tells the story. In the end, Porter teaches them about living and surviving. As Susan said, he brings them into a whole new world of care for God's creation. What is it that you and I need to enter a whole new world of care for God's creation? What do we expect as we inhabit this celestial ball? I ask this from the depth of my heart. What is it we need? Certainly we need creation to feed us, to sustain us, to allow us to have life and breath. There's no question about that. But beyond these primal needs, what else is there? What do we expect from nature all around us, from the lakes and the streams, from the oceans and the waterways, from the sky and the land, and from all creatures great and small? I feel as though God's good earth has been taking care of us all along. Although the story of Genesis calls us to inhabit this earth and it charges us, in God's words, to take care of all that I've given you as stewards, it seems as though the opposite has actually been happening since the creation of humanity. It seems as though we arrived on this earth and ever since the earth has been taking care of us as a species. We have expected so much from the earth. We have taken so much from the earth. And how have we returned thanks by giving back? How have we become stewards of this planet home? I don't mean this as a theoretical or philosophical or theological question. That's not what I'm talking about. I literally mean, what have we done? What have we done? What has each of us returned in thanks for the opportunity to occupy this spinning jewel that is our home? I want you to really think about this. And I'm going to ask it in an interesting way. What trees have you planted and nurtured? What plants have you cared for and given a home? What natural settings have you saved? What species have you helped save from extinction? What animal have you provided a home for? Or which little neighbor who's come upon your property have you allowed to have a habitat there? And what have you done to help our Earth as home? I ask this not as a we question, but really for each one of us to think, what have I done? And I want us to think today as the early Christians did. You see, every single Lord's Sabbath, when the early Christians gathered, they called it the eighth day of creation. In the epistle of Barnabas, which uh, Reverend Joanna, I know you have by your bedstand and read every single night before you go to bed, published around 80 AD, oh, you all have it, the early apostle of Christ, mentioned in the fourth chapter of Acts, wrote these words, The Sabbath which I have made in the name of the Lord, in which I have set all things to rest, is the eighth day, which is the beginning of the whole new world. Wherefore also we keep the eighth day for rejoicing, in which Jesus also rose from the dead, and having been manifested, alive again ascended to heaven. And then just... A few years later, in 160 A.D., Justin Martyr wrote of the eighth day that the water of baptism connects us to all the water of this world, that the wood of the cross connects us to all the trees and all the mysteries of all creation, and that the ascension of Christ into heaven connects us to heaven and the skies above. The mystery of water, earth, and sky are all connected by the day of resurrection. They're all connected. With our connection made on this day of resurrection, this eighth day of creation, we're called to protect and defend the water and the earth and the skies. Because all of this comes from God, 
who's made manifest to us in the resurrected Savior of Christ. For each of us as Christians, let us begin today to claim this day and each Sunday as the eighth day of creation. It is truly the day of resurrection. It is the day of new beginnings. It is the day in which we and all creation begin again. Today and each Sunday, I ask that we remember creation, that we reconnect to creation and restore creation, that each of the eight days of creation for us becomes a new day in a new week, a new way of breathing and stepping into our life on this planet, that each Sunday we begin again, that we begin to reconnect to God's good earth. In our sanctuary, right above where you're seated there, John and Francille, there is a window, the eighth day of creation. High above us are the eight windows of creation. They are glorious from the first day through the eighth day. The eighth day of creation is the one that we're given to live into, to protect the other seven days and nurture the other seven days, to keep them at the center of our hope. And we, as we sit be below this window each Sunday, it beckons us to care for God's good earth on the eighth day of our creation. I was thinking this morning, and I don't want to go really long, but there's, I was thinking of a story that I didn't write down, but a story that comes to us in the spirituality of children written by Robert Coles many years ago. I've shared this story because I love it so much. Robert Coles was a Harvard professor of child psychology. Many of you have read his books and know his work, but he was on a, 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 an Indian reservation, a Native American reservation in the West, and he was visiting the children to understand their spirituality. And he kept asking them about God, and they would just sit there quietly. They were pleasant, but they would never answer any of his questions. And finally, one day, on one of his last days there, a seven-year-old girl took his hand walked up to the front, took his hand, and walked him out of their schoolhouse. And she sat down on the front steps, and she said to him, when you look up, what do you see? And he said, I see clouds, I see the sky. She said, we see God. And when you look out at the grasses in front of you and all of the animals that are around us, what do you see? And he said, I see the grass and the animals. And she said, we see God. You keep asking us about God. God is in everything, everyone, everywhere, all the time. In the mountains, the stones, the soil, God is there. The seven-year-old began to explain God to Robert Coles. What if we believed that? What if we stepped into seeing every single thing, every single moment, every single person around us as the presence of God, it would change everything. As we step into this day of creation, this eighth day of creation, let's use that understanding of God as our new understanding. Let's see the blessedness of God in everything, in everyone, in every, every breath of air. I close with this, with this thought as we prepare to come to the table of grace, which is set with the elements of the earth, right? Bread and grape juice, wine. I close the series with this poem written by Anne about Porter. She writes, chain, waiting for food, for life, for love. Hit, chained, waiting, surviving 3,000 sunsets, countless clouds, hurtling toward a hard stop. One hand with a heart ended the plot. Unchained, a sniff, a whip, a, a nip, a breath, a walk back and again, a run and back and again into safety, into warmth, into nourishment, into love. Venturing out and returning home on a path apart, a circle of trust, gathering tentative greetings, one more, two more, on the way back home. Forward and double back, 
looking up with eyes that love and receive love, curling in, even to sit at a stranger's feet at last. Sniff, a breath, a ripple on the water, a footprint in the snow. The circle widens. I pray that yours is the one hand that ends the plot in connecting with God's good earth and that each of us see and know around us that the earth is crying for healing and hope and depending on us to hear the cries. Amen.